Welcome to the 616 O'Clock News with your hosts, Philip Kingsland John and an overweight white guy in his mid 30s. Yes, this is the 616 O'Clock News. We're, we're trying to uh, create a podcast to encapsulate, to crystallise our passion for comic books and comic book related movies and hopefully say something a little bit different from what everybody else is saying, mainly by tapping into a um, middle aged white guy who I shall refer to as Ian for the remainder of this podcast, uh, mainly by tapping into Ian's obscene imagination. You know, I just feel that there aren't enough. Uh, overweight, middle-aged, well, you know, uh, mid-30s-ish white guys talking about comic books on the internet. So I'm here to redress that balance. Now, what's the theme for today? Our overall theme is going to be female su- uh, superheroes. Um, and I'm going to be drawing, whilst we're talking, I'm going to be drawing uh, an image of Wonder Woman whilst we go. We'll see how it turns out. To start off with the news, what, uh, anything in the news uh, captured your imagination this week? We should talk about uh, the Marvel Netflix uh, stuff which came out of NYCC. And we've got, you know, obviously the first reveal of the Iron Fist trailer, which I know you were a massive fan of, Phil. I was. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was just, I mean, I quite liked it. I wasn't 100% sure with the whole boot polish tattoo job. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm not convinced. Kind of henna tattoo on his chest, you know. Uh, he was waiting in line with a bunch of 14 year old girls to get his henna tattoo done on his chest and stuff. And what are you here to do? Well, I was going to get like kind of a tribal print on my hand. Oh, I'm going to get a fucking like dragon on my chest. Yeah, yeah, it's good. But uh, it, just in terms of the uh, female representation in comic book movies and the, the stuff to come out of NYCC and, well, not comic book movies, but. Uh, you, you've got Sigourney Weaver, uh, Sigourney cast Weaver as the villain in Defenders, which is, yeah. is very exciting. Um, I agree, that is an exciting casting. Sigourney Weaver, obviously, phenomenal actress. Um, she, I, I, saw, I can't remember how old she is now, but I saw her age listed online somewhere. I might look it up quickly. Um, she's like, she's quite old now. 67, she's 67. 67, and like Cabin in the Woods when you saw her in that. And I wonder if she'll be playing a similar kind of like antagonistic matriarch to in, in the same way as she played in Cabin in the Woods where she effectively just cabineered at the end but I mean there's been talk online about her being Madame Hydra or Viper uh, who obviously was featured quite heavily in Brian Michael Bendis' New Avengers run um, but I mean at the moment we just don't know who she'll play you know will it be a gender swapped character akin to like uh, Carrie Ann Moss's you know kind of uh, portrayal of uh, Jaron Hogarth in, in Jessica James or will it be um, will it be someone new or, or will she be playing playing Ripley um, <laughs> and I say that Unlikely, you know, because uh, well uh, you know like obviously in Ripley uh, with Ripley you've got aliens and you've got new and you've got new warning Ripley about these creatures that mostly come at night mostly yeah. and then you think about the heavy sexual content in uh, the Marvel Netflix shows these are characters who mostly come at night Basically, right. uh, and yeah, that's uh, that's my first sexual based pun for for the podcast. Um, so yeah, more news. <laughs> news. What other news is there? That's been uh, okay. Been so uh, out of uh, New York Comic Con, uh, the t- the poster dropped for the, uh, the the third and final Wolverine movie. Indeed, Are you uh, excited about that. But Wolverine holding hands with a, a young girl. I, I suppose that we can uh, suggest with perhaps going to be X twenty three. Um, the the female version of Wolverine, who's currently the the all new, all different Wolverine in Marvel Comics, um, yeah, which is uh, I suppose exciting. Obviously, the R rating makes that film exciting more so than the reunion between Hugh Jackman and that guy who directed Three Tens of Humor and The Wolverine. This is um, the same director, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's the same director as The Wolverine. Um, and so, I mean, I hated that film. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good calls. Good calls. Because it was just uh, a horrific bastardization of what was one of my favourite comic books as a kid. The Chris Claremont Frank Miller. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It was an amazing comic book story about uh, Wolverine and Mariko and Shingen mm. and all of that stuff. And it did not feature a rob- robotic samurai at any point. <laughs> and it didn't even feature him losing his healing factor or any of that shit. It oh, didn't no. need to. It was a great story and they completely. Ruined it. Uh, they, 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 they did. 
there were elements of it which I, I, I enjoyed on a level, particularly because, you know, I went into it with very low expectations and I saw the unrated cut first. Um, but here's hoping that where they took the unrated cut, they can just up that for um, for, for Logan. Uh, I know I mentioned to you earlier um, that the notion of, you know, of finally we have a film which can uh, fully realise the potential of X-Men 2 sequence of a uh, naked Hugh Jackman covered in blood escaping from Weapon X, you know. Because given that our rate, is, given that freedom, you know, you can have something which is um, perhaps, you know, like just, just fulfils that potential. A naked Hugh Jackman just cutting through, cutting through bad guys, lopping off heads, chopping off dicks. And, you know... And that is something that we've never seen before, and I think we are crying out to see. You mentioned that, uh, before we started recording this, uh, the Deadpool... See, a, a naked fight in Deadpool? Indeed, indeed. So, so you, you don't see Deadpool's junk, though, do you? You do see a kind of a shadow of Brian okay. Reynolds' junk. Less than, less, than, less than not Deadpool's junk, unless they enhanced it with CG. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it would be good to see uh, that little Jackman, you know, like come out to play for... For, for Logan I mean why not you know it's R rated I mean ultimately I'd prefer an NC-17 rated version of that movie where it is just Hugh Jackman in the buff you know like cut up <laughs> people I don't know who else that Stephen Merchant's been cut like if it was just a him torturing Stephen Merchant with his claws whilst naked and Lady Gaga's poker face played in the background for an hour and a <laughs> half I'd probably pay five pounds to see that a crisp five pound <laughs> I think that's the news covered in <laughs> there, were, there was just a couple of other things that I wanted to uh, mention, which was Justice League principal shooting finished. Yeah, yeah, um, obviously so, they did that uh, rap video. And, and, and they had a little more. rap video, exactly, with a, a blooper reel. Uh, mm. Did that uh, enthuse you that, you know, obviously they're having so much fun on set, that can only lead to... Uh, a better movie than Batman vs Superman. Well, uh, they seem to be having a lot of fun on set on Suicide Squad as well. You know, they've got these kind of squad tattoos. Uh, oh, did they all get uh, tattoos together? Yeah, yeah. So I suppose it depends who Warner Brothers, uh, you know, kind of like um, franchise out the editing of the movie to. But I mean, obviously, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Jeff Johns has said some kind of encouraging things in terms of like, oh yeah, yeah, we're keeping Zack Snyder on a leash, and you know, like, um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they've taken note from BVS, and I just hope they haven't learned all the wrong lessons from it, in a sense. Um, which I can kind of see them doing, you know, because uh, they're 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 in a place of desperation, you know, their their backs are against the wall, and. Um, yeah, I just hope they, they learn the right lessons from BBS. And, and that, that was the, the tone wasn't a problem. A lot of people were very critical of the tone. Uh, but the tone right. wasn't the problem. It was the, the, the story cohesion. It was uh, the I, ridiculous yeah, I, character motivations. It was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was so much wrong with that film but it's like when people say oh yeah the tone of it was bad it, that almost gives it a justification for how awful it was because it was like oh well you just didn't like the tone <laughs> well we weren't going for the kind of standard superhero shit that you're used to watching this ain't fucking Ant-Man love get the fuck out uh, but in fact the, the, the problem with the film wasn't the tone it was just yeah every, every everything else <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um I, I agree. I mean, they have made a point with with the uh, Justice League trailer and stuff, haven't they? Of like making it really jokey and mm. uh, jovial, and yeah, like, you have that Tony Stark Spider Man sequence yeah, yeah, between. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's very yeah. Tony Stark, isn't it? The way that he's recruiting, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Flash or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So what's well, so that's happening? Justice League is hopefully going to be better than Batman vs Superman. Um, I did see uh, reports on Scott Snyder. You're a fan of Scott Snyder? The, this is the writer of Batman, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the writer of Batman. He's currently writing an all-star Batman for DC. Correct, yes. No relation to Zack Snyder, of course. <laughs> Sat <Satire, satire. laughs> Yeah, unfortunate for him. Um, so I saw in an interview with him that his favourite, he was asked what his favourite story, a Batman story that he's written, mm. uh, and uh, he named Zero Year. Have you read uh, Zero Year at all? Zero Year was uh, the kind of uh, Batman Year One of the New Fifty Two. Kind of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but a lot more it. surreal than Batman yeah, yeah. Year One. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Also, apparently, in Marvel, uh, Marvel news, Marvel superhero comic books have got the highest number of female superheroes, like headlining books that they've ever had. 
Which segues nicely into our uh, our main theme for today. But uh, yeah, what's your reaction to that? Uh, the, the, simply that Marvel have made a, a really concerted effort. I really guess since uh, Sana Matt has come on as you know, kind of like well, the, the creative editor, I suppose. Um, and yeah, yeah, they they they've really made an effort with their with their female characters. Uh, it's not just their but, female characters, but so many they? of those female characters are female versions of characters that were made famous by male. Completely, you know, you've got the new Thor, uh, yeah. which was long thought to be Jane Foster, but now may not be Jane Foster. Oh, really? Um, That's a twist. Indeed, indeed. Um, You've got, uh, obviously, Captain Marvel, formerly Miss Marvel, Carol Danvers. Uh, You've got Silk, who's obviously a relatively new creation by Dan Slott. And you mentioned uh, the all-new Wolverine is... uh, Yeah, yeah, X-23. So, yeah, yeah, a lot of of female characters. Not necessarily with the... the, But, you know, obviously a lot of them are being written by by men. I I, I think Silk's still being written by Robbie Thompson, who's currently writing Venom as well, and Spidey, the kind of like... Uh, and that hasn't been too inspiring. Um, I, I enjoyed Sydney Moon's introduction into Amazing Spider-Man, but that's mainly because I'm a Dan Slott fan. Um, I think the the new She-Hulk comic post Civil War Two is uh, is being written by a woman, and it looks to be quite an interesting kind of like take on the She-Hulk mythology, kind of uh, because it's just called Hulk, uh, and it's okay. you know yeah. Um, yeah they're kind of dealing with Jennifer Walters post the assassination of Bruce Banner in in Civil War Two. I hate it when they take a, a character, an established male character, and then add a female pronoun to it. Say like She Hulk, you know, like Wonder Woman, awesome because you know it's a Wonder Woman. She's not a a female version of some male character. Yeah, and I think in a lot of ways, having like you know like Thor, uh, you say you, you look at it that way, and you know, kind of like, uh, well, you know, like this last is Thor. You know, whether it be Jane Foster or or someone else, it is Thor. It's not she Thor. It's not Thor woman. It's not Hammer bitch or or what have you. You know, um. I quite like to read Hammer bitch. <laughs> Hammer bitch. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd, I'd read Hammer bitch. Um, I'd, I'd love to read Hammer bitch. I'd write Hammer bitch, uh, but then it'd just be like, what an authentic female voice coming from this overweight white man in his thirties. Yeah, um, so, but but obviously, as a, a balance needs to be addressed in terms of getting more female creators into the industry yeah, but it's yeah. not like female creators can only write female, female characters co- exactly, female exactly. characters can um, only be written by female creators well That's the current writer of The Punisher uh, which is being illustrated by um, by Steve Dillon is uh, is a woman a, a literal real life woman <laughs> not writing a female character incredible uh, so, so that's so good. there's hope basically. So there, there is hope, right? Okay, so that's the news done. Surely, yeah, surely. surely. <laughs> there can't be any more news than that, you know. Yeah. Oh, apart from, of course, which is our sweet segue into our Wonder Woman feature, the uh, the revelation of Wonder Woman's sexuality that she is uh, in fact uh, bisexual. You, you read the story? Uh, I did. I did. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd like, uh, obviously, Greg Rooker was asked the question. You know, so is Wonder Woman queer? Um, uh, for for any you know listeners that that aren't aware that the the word queer has been reappropriated by the LGBT community. And uh, Greg Rooker's answer was, yes, yeah, she's had relationships with women women in the past. The idea was that effectively. If Wonder Woman was to leave Themyscira simply for the cock of St- Steve Trevor, the, that would diminish the hero's journey that she was on. Uh, so yeah, she which, doesn't which just, which makes sense absolutely. Which which does take me make sense. Um, it calls into question, as I was saying to to you earlier, uh, the certain other notions about femininity on Themyscira, and these ridiculous kind of like Western culturally conceived notions of of femininity. Uh, shaved legs, uh, shaved pubis, you know, uh, lipstick, you know, all the all these other things, uh, you know, like uh, makeup, uh, yeah, and yeah, like kind of like even the way that women dress in a in a society ruled by women, uh, and where there is no need by which to appeal to the more feminine side that differentiates themselves from a masculine side. Um, that I, I think you know should be explored in further detail. Uh, but obviously, this is a step in the right direction. It's um, you know like kind of like okay, yeah. Obviously, human beings need need love, I, I, not want love. They need it. It's a it's a fundamental human need. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the uh, Wonder Woman's creator 
um, who I, his name really should trip off the tongue, William Molston Morris or something. He loved bondage. He, he, loved he was bondage. very sexually progressive, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it all makes sense. Um, which it would just bring us on nicely to our, uh, our feature for this week, which is Wonder Woman. Um, and... Um, I thought I'd take this opportunity to maybe tell you a little bit because I know you haven't been reading or you missed the New 52 reinterpretation uh, of Wonder Woman. I missed the New 52. <laughs> I literally I missed the New 52. I completely missed the boat on it. Uh, due to economic restrictions more than anything, you know. Okay, well, I, I can't pretend that I've been religiously keeping up with it, but I did enjoy the uh, Brian Azzarello uh, scripted interpretation of Wonder Woman in the New 52 particularly like they did a really cool job of um, bringing the Greek mythology into the story um, so Apollo and Hades and Poseidon and all of these guys are really important characters and they're interpreted in really interesting unusual ways like Poseidon is this massive like whale fish man nice yeah, yeah which is yeah. not what you expected <laughs> uh, Hades is this li- is this creepy little kid who's got loads of candles on his head that are always burning yeah yeah but uh, as Zeus has gone missing basically that's the starting point of the story mm-hmm. Zeus has gone missing and Apollo has taken this opportunity to take control of Olympus uh, before Zeus went missing he shagged some bird in America and knocked her up and she's got a demigod kid and all of the other Olympians want to kill this kid and Wonder Woman is protecting it that's so Zeus uh, I know yeah, exactly yeah. it is so Zeus <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah it's all really really cool but the the uh, the, the sequence which I, there are spoilers here so apologies but hopefully it will inspire you to go and, and find the trades and and to read the story yourself I, I just want to talk about a particular sequence where, which I, I think is absolutely genius and is Brian as a road as the writer it's his from what I've read of his is, is his his fine, finest moment so okay so Eros right god of love yeah yeah yeah. normally he's got the bow and arrow Mm. in this version he's got twin pistols Mm. okay um somehow these these twin pistols end up in the hands of Hades god of the underworld god of death Mm. Hades has kidnapped this uh Zeus's girlfriend um Wonder Woman goes down into Hades to free her Hades takes this opportunity basically to shoot Wonder Woman with the pistols of love. He'll let this woman go um, if Wonder Woman agrees to marry him. Um, And so that basically happens. Wonder Woman is then, there's this whole sequence where she's being done up for the wedding day and she's got this cool dress on where she's got spikes everywhere and like human hands as part of the necklace or jewellery or whatever and she's got these these ladies with dogs heads like making sure that her hair's nice and stuff and so she gets taken to the wedding this is all in Hades in the underworld the underworld in this version is made up of all of the dead souls Hades has complete mental control of it so he can he can form it into whatever he wants um, so he's at this point he's formed it into some kind of cool cathedral as a reader the last thing you saw was that she'd been shot by the bullet of love and yeah, she'd, yeah. she'd agreed to marry Hades uh, so you wonder what's going on in her mind what, what the hell's happening she is brought to the altar at the altar he's basically taken her lasso and made a hangman's noose out of it and for the vows, he basically says, um, I need you to uh, put your head in that noose and swear that you love me. Obviously, the lasso of truth. She yeah, can't yeah. lie once this is around her neck mm. um, because he, he fears that she's like tricking him somehow. So See, I thought he was just going to like put the lasso of truth around his own neck and just like <laughs> strangle wank himself. Uh, that, <laughs> that, that would have been another way to, uh, to do it. He, he probably ends up doing that. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Let's hope. Uh, yeah, she says, so she says she swears that she loves him. He's like, okay, sweet. Mm. Uh, and then he tells her basically to, um, to submit to him, to bind herself to his will. And then obviously, you know, there's this whole kind of bondage subtext running throughout Wonder Woman. Yeah, yeah. And she will not be bound by any man. Mm. And so she's like, fuck you, Hades. Mm. And she, she like breaks free and she's got her lasso of truth. And she goes on the run and all of a sudden Hades becomes this 
uh, the underworld, I mean, becomes this whole kind of uh, seething tumult of like weird corpses that are running after her and she's trying to escape. At this point, an escape party has been launched into the underworld, uh, led by Hephaestus, the, uh, the smith god. So he turns up and he meets Wonder Woman and he's got a, a wedding gift, supposedly he's brought a wedding gift. And he and uh, Hades is like, oh, you can't go, and like whatever. He gives the wedding gift to Hades, mm-hmm. and it's a mirror. There's an argument. He finally agrees to let them go. Wonder Woman explains how it was that she managed to say that I love you with the lasso of truth around her neck, and it's because she loves everybody because oh, she is universal love. Mm. And then as they are on the uh, the boat going o- along the river Styx out of the underworld, uh, Eros is with them. He's reclaimed his pistols from, from Hades. She asks uh, Eros to borrow one of the pistols and she just turns around and takes off one shot. It whistles all the way through the underworld, mm. hits Hades as he's studying the mirror mm. that Hephaestus has given him and it allows him to love himself. That's beautiful, man. <laughs> that is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Presumably leading to uh, strangle leg. <laughs> yeah, she's kind of right. I'm going to go and love myself for like at least 10 to 15 minutes. Is that a lemon? I need that lemon. Um, so, yeah. But that's, that's fucking awesome, right? That is awesome. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah. That is incredible. Um, but yeah, before we before we leave, did you want to speak in uh, in some more general terms about female representation in, in comics? That's exactly what I wanted to do. In yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> These characters, which are you know hypersexualized, really, if we're being honest, mm. how do you interpret them to a modern day and age? Or do you need to? Do you just need because I think Marvel the Marvel movies have done an interesting job of by basically hypersexualizing the males to compensate indeed indeed um i think that ultimately you need a, a, a and i don't want to be like, hey yeah i'm an overweight white man in my in my mid-30s you know uh mansplaining uh feminism to, to people but you need a, a, a spectrum of, of femininity um and it's exactly what i was talking about earlier in terms of you know kind of like themiscara and it being this kind of like almost beautiful male gaze in spite of itself for some women being empowered is being able to wear these outfits and for some women being empowered is you know like covering yourself so you're not an object the notion that the 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 feminine view is somewhat homogenized uh and you know like is only expressed through one avenue or one opinion is is ridiculous absolutely Um, and also in a in a world where like these conflicts are generally ended by beating the other person to a pulp (laughs) (laughs) how does like how does femininity play into that i mean i think azarello like as a man writing wonder woman like in some ways is it is acceptable to go oh she's she's a woman and therefore her answer is love but also she can kick your ass. <laughs> yeah, it's a... Or is that is that in itself a, um, I don't know, a, a, a sexist stereotyping of what femininity is? I, but that's the, that's the very thing. In a sense, it is for some people, and in a sense, it isn't for, for other people, you know? Um, that's ultimately the thing. When we make generalisations, we're making generalisations which just simply aren't inclusive uh, because generalizations by their very nature aren't inclusive yeah but i mean there, there's comic books are all about idealizing the human form whether it's masculine or feminine indeed right? indeed yeah and, yeah and there's something fine about that i think i mean there's something cool about that you know it's like the greek statues of the of the gods it's indeed. like you want to you want heracles to have like ridiculously huge pecs i mean <laughs> yeah, <you laughs> otherwise it's not heracles but, right it's more of a cultural statement in that moment. Uh, right, I'm glad we've solved that. What? <laughs> yeah, I've solved it. Yeah. We've said it like giving like really bullshit generalist answers. Like, yeah, man, yeah, space is all subjective. <laughs> so, so on yeah, that, on yeah. that note, you were telling me about Lara Croft. I don't play computer games, but you were telling me about Lara Croft earlier, the, the reinvention of Lara Croft. Indeed, the, the desexualized uh, version of Lara Croft. Desexualized, uh, resexualized. <laughs> The resexualized, the, the, the reconceptual, uh, the reconceptualized sexualization of Lara Croft for the twenty first yeah. century, uh, and yeah, yeah, obviously, you know, like Lara now, she's not some kind of like busty page three, page 
Japanese three stunner. She's in her little short shorts and her fucking titties are like pyramids. Oh yeah, wicked Jackie boys. <laughs> um, you know, like kind of like a wank fantasy. Instead, she's this kind of like uh, you know, kind of slender thigh gap. You know, kind of like desktop wank fantasy. Um, <laughs> So, you know, like, so I'm playing Bryce of the Tomb Raider today, and, you know, there's Lara Croft, you know, powerful, you know, like, kind of feminist icon of 2015, because the game was released last year on the Xbox One. You, you play this intro where she's, you know, kind of like, oh, she's climbing rocks or something, um, and she's climbing, like, icy mountains, but then as soon as you get into the, like, kind of meat and bones of the, the, the actual game, uh, she's in her vest top again with her khakis on. Oh, really? And literally... Before you even get to play a sequence, she's her, her car's been shot up, and she gets out of this car. You know, she's got a, a, like a little like non-offensive scratch on her forehead, but the, the, most notably, her vest top is covered on at least one side with blood, making her tit shine, or oh, her breast shine. I, I, should, I should say, so you know, she's got blood tits. And, you know, like, what do men love? If men don't love blood and tits, I don't know what they love. Uh, you know, like, say, yeah, fuck it, I love it when fucking things blow up and there's blood and shit everywhere. And I love tits. And, uh, yeah. We were also talking about uh, Supergirl, which, again, I haven't seen. Like, Supergirl season two's just started and we get to meet Superman, who's played by Taylor Hoechlin. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Up, just go, oh yeah, Joe, uh, G, Mr. White, uh, I get that G and Liggity Split. Uh, what do you mean people don't say Liggity Split anymore? Uh, you say Great Caesar's Ghost. Uh, uh, well, anyway, I'm fucking off to Central City, so he fucks off to Central City. And um, in the in the promos for it, which I believe I mentioned to you before, there was this line where Finn, who's the friend zoned, like, kind of, uh, like, male accomplice of Supergirl, um, <coughs> Basically, you know, like, goes, oh my god, Superman, I got so many questions. How do you shave? And again, in terms of, like, uh, the disparity between uh, the representation of male and female characters, nobody would ask Supergirl that, character, that, that question, you know. The idea that she is just this perfect, hairless creature that's walking around in this tiny little short skirt with, with no pubis hanging out between her, like, little super knickers that they love to show on the show. Yeah. Um, the, the fact that, you know, like, when she's in her, you know, kind of, like, short dresses to impress sexy Jimmy Olsen, uh, you know, like, <laughs> she's got no underarm hair or what have you. And nobody says to her, fucking hell, Supergirl, why don't you shave? You know? Uh, yeah. And it's this notion that women should be Presented, it. but again, it harkens back to this uh, socially constructed nature of femininity. Sure, and, um, it, and it makes me think of the Man of Steel John Byrne series, where indeed, which yeah, is yeah, revealed yeah. that Superman shaves by heat visioning his own hair off with a reflective piece of metal taken from the crashed Krypton, Kryptonian rocket ship. If I remember right, and I, I was thinking about this after you left and stuff. Doesn't he like put on a razor in the back? Doesn't somebody come to? Is it like, yeah, yeah, no, he's, 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 yeah. He turns on his electric <laughs> razor yeah. to cover the <laughs> it. yeah. It's like actually the electric razor needs to be used on someone's face, so they just be like, "Why is he just like idling that razor in the background?" <laughs> like, what the fuck? What's he actually doing in there? I, I am really intrigued by this. How how does Supergirl shave her legs? She must have some weird convex mirror chamber. Yeah, yeah. She's got some kind of mirror chamber where she, she shaves her legs, she shaves her ass crack. <laughs> because women don't naturally have hairless ass cracks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to break that to anybody out there who's listening. But, yeah, so she shaves her ass crack. She shaves... And she gives herself a nice Brazilian or, you know, kind of like a... a you know... She shaves... Oh, she shaves under her arms. But she's in this fucking, like... But, 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 but she's, she's not shaving. She's, she's fucking... Yeah, yeah, she's burning off. Lasering yeah, yeah. shit off. Yeah. And, you know, and, like, particularly getting towards, you know, like, kind of her, her vaginal area, you know, like, that, that, that's some tender work, I tell you. You don't um, want to slip with the old uh, heat vision. Yeah, yeah, you don't, <laughs> you don't just, like, heat vision your clit or something. <laughs> <laughs> just a scorch. <laughs> Um, so yeah, what a what an awful life Supergirl must lead in order to maintain that presence of being a girl and super. Right, um, which leads us to our last segment of the show, uh, which is Ian's pitch of the week. So hopefully every week, if your imagination can keep uh, keep up with it, <laughs> Ian is going to pitch a wonderfully esoteric, off the wall 
unusual, unprecedented vision of what cinematic entertainment could be. And what is your pitch of the week, Ian? My pitch of the week, uh, it's the first episode, so, you know, I want to tie it back into in, into comics uh, and, and, you know, like and take inspiration from an already existing title. Um, so... Obviously, Robbie Bryce's Ghost Rider has been a, a, a big thing in in Marvel TV. You know, it's actually you know like obviously Marvel taking back the rights to Ghost Rider and for the third time in a row after Punisher, which was distributed uh, internationally by Columbia, who are part of Sony, Spider Man, who obviously is uh, Columbia Studios slash Sony property, and now Ghost Rider. That is Marvel are three for three on doing things better than fucking Sony ever have after owning these rights for for ages um, so I was, I was thinking about Ghost Rider I was thinking about my childhood affection for Ghost Rider um, and I think it ties back into my childhood affection for heavy metal um, and a lot of the kind of like heavy metal aesthetic of Ghost Rider and he is he's fucking you know he rides a motorbike he's wearing leathers he's got a fucking yeah, flaming sure. skull he's got, he's for got a head. spikes all over he's him got, he's fucking metal as fuck chains it's like a chains <laughs> fucking but, you yeah. know but that whole metal aesthetic presumably I can't remember the soundtrack for the Ghost Rider movies they were heavy metal were they I, I, something I like that I assume so I mean I like um, I, I remember the, the, uh, the, the second Ghost Rider movie uh, Spirit of Vengeance uh, um, which features Idris Elba and uh, Syrian Hine, Kyrian Hines, uh, Caesar Hines, from yeah, Brady, yeah, yeah. and uh, Anthony Stewart Head, and uh, and it's filmed in Eastern Europe and it's fucking awful. And it's basically, um, how, I mean, what an incredible cast to they get waste, together to make they a terrible even movie. Nick Cage is, is gold on a kitchen. <laughs> But yeah, and then the first Ghost Rider movie, which they just... It's Sam Elliott's in that shit, for fuck's sake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we can't talk about the first Ghost Rider movie. It's just it's too bad. beyond awful. But anyway, I'd say Marvel have done right by, by Ghost Rider. And, and so, but anyway, I was thinking about Ghost Rider. I was thinking about why I love it. And then I was thinking about that kind of whole aesthetic, how it ties into heavy metal. And that, that heavy metal aesthetic was pioneered by Rob Halford, the lead singer of Judas Priest, who's a homosexual. Uh, and then I was thinking about homosexuals in relation to monotheistic religions and so forth, and the often damnation which they face. Uh, you know, the, uh, I like the, the I like the direction this is going in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, a homosexual heavy metal fan finds himself condemned to hell because of his sexuality, okay. or at least that's what the devil tells him. So, and then he's offered the chance by the devil to go and wreak vengeance upon the fucking homophobes that pollute the earth and the God, the God that would condemn him to hell just simply for loving the person that he loves. So Who is the person that he loves? Is that not important? It's just a dude. (laughs) (laughs) Just just, just a gay guy. Uh, (laughs) uh, So anyway, so uh, he he leaves hell, uh, now filled with the spirit of vengeance, and uh, he goes and wreaks vengeance upon, you know, kind of like... uh, you know, the, the, the Christian fundamentalists, uh, you know, uh, anti-abortion doctors. Does he have any sense of irony in terms of how he exacts this vengeance? No. <laughs> he is the ghost writer. Uh, no, I know. I, because the thing is, you know, you pitch this idea, and it's like the ghost. He's gonna fuck him to death with his fire cock, uh, and then obviously, just even on a more kind of simple level, kind of like, uh, what? He's a flaming queen. He's literally a flaming queen. And it's just like, no, no, that sounds too homophobic. Or even the notion that, you know, kind of like a homosexual would be condemned to hell because of his sexuality. That That's just really, that seems homophobic on the surface level. Uh, but it's not. It's honestly not. It's, it's this notion of, like, like, I'm an atheist, so I don't believe in heaven or hell, but I believe in the hypocrisy of my theism. So calling that out in, in this way would, would be good. Um... So anyway, he gets to, to wreak vengeance on this, and then he meets a kind of, like, a uh, partner um, who he, he saves from some, like, rednecks who are, g- are going to, like... Uh, I believe the term is... And I, I hate myself for even saying this, but fag drag him by tying a chain to his feet and dragging him along from a car and so forth. I'd say Ghost Rider saves him anyway. And then he becomes kind of Ghost Rider's partner in crime. Um, and then it kind of like takes on a new level. And, like, and he says, you know, well, what's your objective here? And it's like, you know, I'm going to punish the guilty, the people guilty of the sin of, you know, kind of like homophobia and uh, the, the ignorance and hate. Um, and then I'm going to punish the, the guy who's responsible for this and I'm going to punish God 
Uh, and his idea is because he's the ghost rider. And what I love about, like, say, like Robbie Breast's interpretation of ghost rider is he drives a car uh, rather than a motorbike. You know, the ghost rider doesn't need to be like, ah, you're not going to drive a motorbike. He, he drives a car. So if he can ride a motorbike and drive a car, surely he can ride anything, yeah? Okay. So yeah. he can ride this guy by piggybacking on him, <laughs> and then he becomes this kind of like. <laughs> It's meat mobile, and he just rides over this guy. <laughs> He's screaming, and like fire's coming out of his mouth, and his legs are on fire. <laughs> but he can also ride all kinds of other stupid shit, like Ferris wheels and tricycles. <laughs> but it becomes an important plot point because. But, like, what. I love the idea of like, his cohort, his, his newfound friend, like saying, "Yeah, I found this this den of this, this den of homophobia," and then, then go, "I'm ready, I'm ready for vengeance," and then go, "Yeah, it's this mosque," and then go, "I'm not fucking attacking a mosque. Are you serious?" I'd be like, "I'm not taking it that fucking extent. But no, seriously, there's a bunch of homophobes in that mosque. I, I'm not attacking a mosque. Fuck off. Um, you know. Uh, so yeah, like obviously he's got he's got boundaries, but then he ends up riding an eight angel because he basically he kills all these fucks who are at this kind of ceremony like kind of like raising this angel to what in what level of detail have you planned this whole thing out uh, it's about 50 episodes <laughs> or 50 issues and so anyway then like these fuckers are like summoning this angel to bless this kind of like miracle child who's going to be the ultimate heterosexual uh, <laughs> angel and he rides this angel up into heaven and he's up in heaven and he's fucking up angels left and right and stuff and then he comes face to face with God and he's like you fucking homophobic prick and uh yeah yeah and then God just goes what the fuck dude seriously like what the fuck I love all my creations. I love all my children. The devil's tricked you. He's like, what? And it's like, the devil's tricked... I, I, you weren't ever sent to hell because of, you know, like, your your sexual preferences and so forth. Uh, you know, and any ignorance on part of my followers is just simply misinterpretation of my intention and so forth. And it, it, it's, it's culturally conceived. It's not... And he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> he's, he's killed, like, all these angels and stuff. He's got his fire chains around him. He's like, no, no, no. Uh, you know, like, obviously, and it, 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 it was always the devil. It was always the devil which plants to, he planted the seeds of hatred amongst uh, amongst my people. Amongst my, the only lesson I ever, ever wanted to teach humanity was be good to each other, like Jerry Springer. Um, and the ghost rider's like, like Jerry Springer. And he's like, yeah, yeah, like Jerry Springer. And, uh, and so then Ghost Rider leaves heaven, <laughs> but, you know, with this message of like hope and love. And he goes and kills a bunch of other fucking people as he goes in like in search of the devil for the devil tricking people into thinking that homosexuals are bad. And it ends with him killing the devil. <laughs> Sweet, man. <laughs> yeah. That sounds amazing. So, yeah, that's my idea for a gay ghost rider. Okay. Good. So, um, that is a horrifically bloated, <laughs> uh, indulgent podcast. Um, next week, we might be talking about legacy sequels. Legacy sequels, uh, yeah, yeah, a bright topic for conversation. And what is a legacy lega sequel, Ian? It's a sequel set within the same universe as something which would usually be rebooted in Hollywood, but in fact, you know, like, yeah, just explores it a little further. Uh, Jurassic World, Star Wars episode seven, eight, and nine, uh, and uh, yeah, various other. Hurrah. Hurrah, indeed. <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe we shall chat you then. Uh, if if they want to, if people, if anybody ever listens to this and wants to uh, get in touch with us, how can they do that? Uh, they can't get in touch with me because I'm not on any form of social media and I'm not giving out my email address, but <laughs> Phil, <laughs> leave yeah. comments below and... Uh, seriously, I might send you some death threats or what have you. I'm very sensitive. Um, yeah, leave comments below. I think it's probably leave comments below. You 